Good evening to the start of the seventh annual Iona Campanola Annual Lecture in Restorative Justice. And I'd like to call upon Chief Nicole Rempel of the Comox First Nation to give an Aboriginal welcome. I say it every time, I'm never as tall as the previous speaker before me. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. As Bruce said, my name is Nicole Rempel. I'm the elected chief of the Comox First Nation. <clears throat> and on behalf of the Comox people, I welcome you tonight to the unceded traditional territory of the Comox people. I'm honored to welcome tonight's guest lecturer, Minister of Justice, the Honorable Jody Wilson-Raybould, who actually has family connections to our people here in Comox, so yay. <laughs> <laughs> welcome home. <laughs> As a First Nations leader, I can't express how proud I am of her accomplishments and that we have her strong voice in Ottawa. And as a woman First Nations leader, I'm doubly so. I hope you enjoy tonight's lecture, Imut. A little taller. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Andrew Stringfellow for all those people who don't know the only black person in the Comox Valley. <laughs> I am delighted to welcome all of you here tonight to the Community Justice, on behalf of the Community Justice Center's uh, seventh annual Iona Campanolo Lecture on Restorative Justice. It's a real pleasure to see such a large and diverse crowd out here um, at this year's lecture. <clears throat> There's what, there was only three people here when, I, when we came in the back and I thought, oh, that'll be easy. The Campanola Lectures are the premier event of CJC's annual calendar events and the highlight of our work in public education around the issues of restorative justice. The CJC has been working for many years to bring reconciliation to the, to the people of the Comox Valley as we begin our 20th anniversary of celebrations. As, community, as a community-based volunteer organization, we are very proud of what we have been able to accomplish. This year, we have invited to our lecture a strong indigenous woman who grew up in the Comox Valley, attended Highland High School, and has gone on to accomplish many, many great things. We can all be very proud of her as one of our own. Needless to say, restorative justice has been the heart of everything we do across every aspect of our wide-ranging program of work. We use restorative justice principles to bring harmony to our community by assisting those in conflict to a place of reconciliation. Whether it be a young person who needs to learn accountability or an adult in conflict with the law, a victim of elder abuse, or someone harmed by racism, hatred, and homophobia. The CJC's programs have immense capacity to bring healing, that bring the healing process and restore the peace. As an, as an organization, we have over 150 residents of the Comox Valley who dil diligently serve as dedicated volunteers of this work. So on behalf of all of the Community Justice Center, welcome to the seventh annual Campanola le Lectures. Now I would like to call John Bowman, the president of uh, North Island College, uh, as one of our partners on the project to welcome you on behalf of the college. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to represent North Island College at this great event. On behalf of NIC, it's a pleasure to welcome you, and uh, I want to just take a moment to uh, express our appreciation on, from North Island College to the Community Justice Centre for all of the great work they do. And I want to, uh, in particular, say thank you to uh, Chief Administrator Bruce Curtis for his leadership. 
Uh, this event has become one of the premier events in the Comox Valley, and we're certainly very proud to be a part of it. We also have amongst us many honored guests, special guests, and I'm proud that we have a strong contingent of students from the college here. So maybe if you're a college student or a college employee, just wave your hand so you can see how many are here. Quite a strong group. Thank you very much for being here. I think these lectures have contributed greatly to the prestige of the event and contribute greatly to public education and community development in the Comox Valley. And that's why NIC was very proud to uh, formalize our partnership with the CJC this year to ensure that it has ongoing financial support from NIC and we hope that that will contribute to its longevity and sustainability. The CJC and everyone who's involved in restorative justice truly is making our community an even better place to live. So I also want to thank all of you for participating and for great, the great work you do. Thank you very much. Well, I see you surprised by who we have coming to introduce our speaker, the Honorable Iona Campanola, patron of the Community Justice Center. Dear, isn't this a wonderful moment to have Jody Wilson Raybould with us and to be able to honor her achievement? I think uh, I'll begin by saying Jody's mom is here tonight, Ms. Wilson. You're quoting your dad, Jody, so I wanted to introduce your mom. <laughs> oh dear. So, honored leaders of the Comox Valley and valued guests, and I'm so pleased and honored to introduce our guest for this evening, the Honorable Jody Wilson Raybould, Canada's first Indigenous Minister of Justice and Attorney General for Canada. I'm sure that many of us think of Minister w uh, Wilson Raybould as being one of us. She was raised in Vancouver and later Comox, graduating from Ecole Highland Secondary School. She completed her Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and history at the University of Victoria, and then went on to earn a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of British Columbia. Her talent was recognized very early, famously in 1983 at the Constitutional Conference. Her father, Bill Wilson, cautioned Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, I have two preteens at home. They're both going to study law and they both want to be Prime Minister. <laughs> Well, Mr. Trudeau quipped and said, oh well, I think I'll stay until they're ready. <laughs> Little did we know his son would carry on. <laughs> oh, well, as Miss Wilson Raybould was becoming a name in Aboriginal leadership, Bill Wilson was very modestly quoted in the Vancouver Sun once as saying, Jody is the brightest Indian in the country. <laughs> Next to me. <laughs> well, both of these forecasts have been proven eminently true. Following graduation from law school, Ms. Wilson served four years as a Crown Prosecutor in Vancouver's downtown east side, one of Canada's most vulnerable and troubled communities. There she exhibited compassion and strength in a very difficult job. 
Recruited by Miles Richardson, then Chief Commissioner of the BC Treaty Commission, she served six years as a commissioner and 18 months as acting Chief Commissioner. This followed then Chief Commissioner Stephen Point's appointment as Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia. Speaking of his recruitment of Wilson Raybould, Miles Richardson said, Jody has always been her own person. She has a deep sense of her own values and the courage to live by them. I will. Oh my. <laughs> Who is operating this microphone? <laughs> Turn it up. <laughs> is that better? Good. Thank you for telling me. Speaking of her recruitment, Miles Richardson said, Miles Richardson said, Jody has always been very much her own person, and she has the courage to live by her values. I wanted the best talent I could find, so I asked Judy and told her she was needed. needed. I asked Jody and she was needed. During her term, she worked on multiple treaties, and it was under her watch the Chawasan First Nation successfully concluded its treaty, the first achieved under the BC Treaty process. Subsequently, she successfully ran for two terms as BC Regional Chief for the Assembly of First Nations. However, it was following a meeting with then Prime Minister Stephen Harper during the Idle No More demonstrations that she made her decision to run for federal office. She was actively recruited by the Liberal Party of Canada as a candidate, and she won the nomination of Vancouver Granville. That was in November. And, um, all comfy? <laughs> Wonderful being old. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, in 2016, Ms. Wilson Rabel was invited to the to deliver the 13th annual Australian National University Reconciliation Lecture, which she titled "Moving Through the Postcolonial Door." Reconciliation in a post-colonial Canada requires all Canadians, every single one of us, to learn from our collective history and to move out of the shadows of past injustices. This will help to transform the relationship between Indigenous people and historic federally imposed governments towards self-governance and true partnership within the Canadian Confederation to ensure a more just, inclusive, and respectful society. The contributions of restorative justice and restorative practices to this process have been being presented in that context. Now in 2018, to deliver this year's lecture, taking a new approach to criminal justice reconciliation and restorative justice. I am so delighted to be able to introduce Attorney General for Canada, Queen's Privy Councillor, Member of Parliament, the Honourable Minister for Justice, Jody Wilson.
sorry. There we go. Well, Gala Kusla, good evening, everyone. I know you can see me, but I'm having a hard time seeing you. Um, the lights are bright. But I am uh, incredibly honored and very pleased to be back in the Comox Valley. And um, thank you for inviting me back here. And um, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge the territory of the Comox peoples, and I'm very pleased uh, that uh, Chief Rempel is here. And um, thank you for, for welcoming um, everyone um, to uh, North Highland College, to the um, Comox Valley Community Justice Center. Thank you for inviting me here for this, the seventh annual Iona Campanolo Lecture, and for the great honor of the fellowship. Um, I, as I said just across the way, I'm a Comox girl. I am so happy to be, to be here. Um, I come from, as many of you in the room know, I come from the Muskema, Zawadanek, and Likwitka people just north of here. Um, my, my mother is here, as you know. My husband, uh, Tim, is here, and we, uh, we have a home in Cape Mudge, which we get to maybe two or three times a year now. But when we do, um, we celebrate it. My my father, uh, Bill Wilson, his name is Himas Klalilikla, and my my grandmother name grandmother's name was Pugladi. Um, so with that introduction, I again am pleased to be here. The last time I was in this theater. Uh, I was um, singing in um, Anne of Green Gables through... <laughs> um, I can't remember the part that I played, but it was with Highland. I'm, I'm, great, I'm greatly proud to be an alum from Highland, and I was, previous to that, sitting up in that box right there was the left light for a fiddler on the roof in a previous year. <laughs> so. First of all, at um, the outset, I want to say and thank you to all of the esteemed people that are in the room, all of the elected leadership, my colleague in uh, the House of Commons. Um, it uh, has um, been an incredible three years for me, um, three years since I had uh, the privilege to be elected as a member of parliament for Vancouver Granville and uh, certainly um, have been given the honor um, of being the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada by um, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. And thinking about the appointment, I believe it speaks volumes for how far we've come as a country and certainly how far we still have to go. And as I've said elsewhere, um, and as the amazing Iona Campanolo was talking about, um, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say how incredibly honored I am to have her be here and introduce me and to acknowledge the incredible contribution that Iona has given and made not only to our great province of British Columbia but across the country in terms of her lifetime of public service. So uh, it's incredibly humbling to, um, to be, have been introduced by her. So as I, I said, said elsewhere, I um, view my appointment as minister not so much as a reflection on myself, but rather as a symbol of change. That in a nation where not so long ago an indigenous person didn't have the right to vote, let alone run for office or practice as a lawyer, is now the principal lawyer in charge of administering the laws and advising the government of the country. For me, it has become even clearer over the past few years just how significant the challenges are to realize the challenges that still remain, both externally and internally within government, in changing a system that, when it comes to Indigenous peoples, is still fundamentally based on colonial institutions and operating through outdated laws and policies. So part of what I want to reflect on tonight is how after three years of being a Minister of the Crown, I still have to contend both personally and professionally with a colonial legacy that remains pervasive despite best intentions and which is exacerbated by the trials and tribulations of partisan politics. That said, progress is being made 
and I'm deeply optimistic and confident there is light at the end of the tunnel as we move forward as a country with the work of supporting Indigenous nation rebuilding within a strong, diverse, and vibrant Canada. But significant issues still remain, and I want to share some thoughts to you, with you tonight on how we can overcome them. For me, it is all about finding balance in society. And this lecture series on restorative justice provides a space for bold ideas and reflections on how we can achieve this. Judge Ross Green, when he gave this lecture, defined restorative justice as to, quote, restore harmony between the offender, the victim, and the community after a transgression, end quote. When former Chief Justice, the Right Honorable Beverly McLaughlin was here, she spoke of restorative justice as a way to heal communities and reminded us that of the history of restorative justice as being one of the first and most human forms of justice. For me, my understanding, support, and work to advance restorative justice is framed by my background. In my culture, and one that many of us in the room share, there is great importance placed on reflecting on experiences one has had, the lessons those carry, and passing those on so that they may be of assistance to others. One of the most, um, or one of, the, one of those that was passed on to me, and which helps guide what I do, is about the role of balance in life and existence. In our culture, all things are in their greatest state of well-being when there is balance, whether it is balance between humans and the natural world, between groups of peoples, within family or community, or in how we live and organize our own lives. Balance is viewed as the proper state of things where conditions of harmony and justice flourish, while imbalance is what gives rise to conflict, confrontation, and harm. Such a holistic approach to keeping balance in society helps to ensure that all people can achieve their goals and meet their full potential and contribute to the community regardless of circumstance or fate. In the Indigenous political and legal system in which I was raised, it is in the big house where balance is maintained. It is in the big house where our laws are made, disputes settled, and important decisions taken. In this system, there are no political parties. Rather, there is a belief in consensus. The issues are debated, and while everyone may not agree with every aspect of the decision taken, consensus, and if necessary, compromise, is sought in order to achieve balance in society. To help ensure that decisions are durable, legitimate, and survive the test of time. Maybe this is because we lived together in small villages and people did not simply leave, but I like to think it is because we value everyone's opinion and everyone's voice counts, not just a few. These legal traditions are quite different from the ones that I was formally trained in at law school, and in supporting the expansion of restorative justice programs within broader, in the broader justice system, we are finding ways that the plural and diverse legal traditions in Canada can play their role in building peace, safety, and harmony in society, and play their role in addressing serious challenges like the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in the criminal justice system. So, with those initial thoughts, let me take some time first to reflect on some of the ongoing challenges to reconciliation and the empowerment of Indigenous peoples. And then next I'll turn to more specifically talk about restorative justice with some comments on incremental steps that are now being taken in support of the more ambitious objective of reconciliation. Simply stated, there is a need for reconciliation because we have a history of such imbalance in the relationship with Indigenous peoples in this country. Rather than a history of distinct peoples, nations, and governments, Europeans and Indigenous peoples coming together to form a balanced and proper relationship with one another, 
the predominant reality has been the imposition of laws and policies that deny the basic rights and freedoms of Indigenous peoples. This broke up Indigenous nations, governments, and systems of law, land holdings, community, and family. While some treaties were entered into in the past that promised a balanced relationship, these typically have not been honored or upheld. More broadly, denial of Indigenous rights, including treaty rights, has been the norm. Today we see the effects of this imbalance all around us in poverty, disempowerment, and marginalization of Indigenous peoples, including massive rates of suicide, a crisis in Indigenous child's in children in care, and of course, the overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in the criminal justice system. All of these are symptoms of our history of an imbalanced relationship, of imposition and colonialism, rather than true partnership and cooperation. In seeking balance, we can find solutions through reconciliation based on the recognition of Indigenous rights and thereby strengthening our system of cooperative federalism. We, out, we now understand how the socioeconomic conditions and challenges faced by Indigenous peoples are completely intertwined and interconnected with the issues of Indigenous rights. Our colonial history has been one of disempowerment, imposition, and control by government over the lives of Indigenous peoples, spiritually, physically, culturally, socially, politically, and legally, with the result being patterns, again, of powerlessness, poverty, and hopelessness. Transforming these social conditions requires supporting the work of Indigenous peoples to determine their own future, rebuild their nations and governments, exercise control and jurisdiction, and be responsible for the well-being of their peoples to uphold and protect their rights and freedoms. There have been, of course, some important milestones which promised to overcome the history of imbalance. Perhaps most important was the adoption of Section 35 in the Constitution of 1982, which recognized and affirmed the title rights and treaties of Indigenous peoples. As we know, this was adopted at the same time that we adopted the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But if we honestly look back, we see that the promise of Section 35 has largely been, been fulfilled, unfulfilled, because of the choices that have been made to maintain the imbalance. For example, consider for a moment the rights all of us hold under the Charter, freedom of speech, religion, association, and so on. We do not question the existence of these rights. Why we, or while we will continue to have disagreements about the scope, extent, and the expression of certain rights, government does not say to individual Canadians that they must prove that they have the right to free speech before taking action to uphold and implement those rights. Rather, after 1982, active steps have been taken and continue to be taken every day to ensure those rights are protected. This includes internal processes and requirements to ensure new laws are tested and examined to ensure that they are compliant with the Charter, to amending old legislation, which is clearly inconsistent with the Charter, to changing laws which the courts say should be adjusted for Charter compliance. This has not been the case with Indigenous rights in Section 35 of the Constitution. Rather than taking action to recognize, uphold, and implement those rights, successive governments insisted that these rights had to be proven through long and expensive court proceedings. Even then, as a result of hundreds of court decisions that have upheld Indigenous rights, very few laws have changed to demonstrate recognition and respect for Indigenous rights. Indeed, we live in a country where the primary law governing the, land, the, the lives of the majority of Indigenous peoples, First Nations, is still a colonial law, the Indian Act, which is over 100 years old and seeks to define who Indigenous peoples are and impose patterns of life on them. In other words, the imbalance remains in our midst. So while we have made much progress on many fronts, 
At the same time, we have continued to perpetuate and maintain the denial of rights and ideas, systems, and laws that prevent the, co the conditions of harmony and justice and equality, of true recognition and reconciliation. We have prevented this from flourishing. So how do we truly overcome this imbalance to advance true reconciliation? Let me be a little bit candid for a few minutes. I believe there are three things that are needed for true reconciliation to take root in Canada. First, we must want and desire it to happen. Second, we must know how to accomplish it. And third, we must have the volition and will to see it through. We must take tangible action. To say it another way, we must have the intention, the knowledge, and capacity, and the indomitable will to transform long entrenched patterns of injustice, inequality, and replace them with new patterns grounded on the recognition and implementation of Indigenous rights. Not that long ago, perhaps only a decade ago, I probably would not have said we are seriously, um, I probably would have said we are seriously in, uh, deficient in all three of these areas. But this has changed because Canadians, people like you, all across the country in new and dynamic ways every day are expressing the desire to see true reconciliation manifest itself in the life of society. We also know how to accomplish true reconciliation. Years of tireless advocacy by leaders before us, dozens of reports, studies, including the Royal Commission on Royal Commissions, including the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and hundreds of court cases, as well as the practical experiences on the ground with examples of where there has been success, all show us the way forward and tell us what needs to be done. And it all comes back to recognizing rights and acting on them, including taking concrete action to change laws, policies, and operational practices that are offside with reconciliation as we support Indigenous peoples in rebuilding. We do have the answers. The question now is do we have the volition and the will to see it through, to take action? And this is where I see ourselves today. While strides forward have been made, we are not there yet. We have to constantly remind ourselves that words, especially in the context of reconciliation, have meaning. Recognition for Indigenous peoples across, across the country and as the basis for true reconciliation has meaning. It means that Indigenous peoples governed and own the lands that now make up Canada prior to the arrival of Europeans. It means that Indigenous laws and legal orders that stewarded the lands for millennia remain and must continue to operate in the contemporary world. It means that the title and rights of Indigenous peoples are inherent and not dependent or contingent on court orders, agreements, or government action for their existence, substance, and effect. It means that treaties entered into historically must be fully implemented based on their spirit and intent, oral histories as well as texts, and consistent with the true meaning of a proper nation to nation and government to government relationship. It means that the distinct and diverse governments, laws, cultures, societies, and ways of life of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit are fully respected and reflected. For Canada, reconciliation means resetting our foundations to properly reconcile, to finish the unfinished business of confederation. What is more, for Indigenous peoples, reconciliation is the lifeline that will ensure the survival and rebuilding of their cultures, languages, and governing systems within an even stronger Canada. But words are also easy. And too often, we see the tendency, especially in politics, to use important words that have real meaning and importance carelessly. We see them being applied to ideas and actions that in truth do not reflect their actual meaning, even sometimes their opposite. 
We see recognition applied to ideas that actually mean denial. We see self-government used to refer to ideas or processes that actually main contr maintain control over others. We see self-determination applied to actions that actually interfere with the work of nations rebuilding their governments and communities. We see inherent in the same breath as the contradictory idea that rights are contingent on courts or agreements. When we see this being done, this does not advance reconciliation. It actually undermines it. It causes confusion, chaos, and division. It treats a challenge, a challenge that is vital to the survival and well-being of children, women, families, and communities across the country as a game of rhetoric. It trivializes, often out of ignorance or political expediency, a moral, social, and economic imperative for our country. Words in the work of reconciliation are also cheap without real action. Action that goes to the core of undoing the colonial laws, policies, and practices, and that is based on the real meaning of reconciliation. And we all need to understand this. The path to justice and equality is not advanced or achieved through half measures, good intentions, or lofty rhetoric. And it is certainly not achieved by the obfuscation or confusion about what we mean when we speak. Hard choices, innovative actions, transformation in laws, policies, new understandings and attitudes, new patterns of behavior, this is what's needed. So reflecting on this, I have outlined in many speeches in recent years what I see as the minimum elements of new relations based on the recognition of rights, building on what Indigenous peoples have advocated over generations. These include harmony between the laws of Canada and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the replacement of comprehensive claims policies, the inherent right of self-government policy, and consultation and accommodation approaches with policies based on rights recognition. Legislated binding standards on all public officials to ensure that they act in all manners with Indigenous peoples based on the recognition of title and rights. Legislated binding obligations on the Crown to take action in partnership with Indigenous nations to implement models of self-government that are determined by Indigenous peoples. Accountable, independent oversight of the conduct of government respecting Indigenous rights, as well as new methods of dispute resolution uh, that include applications of Indigenous laws and processes. New institutions that are independent of government and designed in partnership with communities that support the work of rebuilding their nations and governments. And development of proper processes and structures between Canada and Indigenous governments for decision making, including in order to obtain free, prior, and informed consent. So with that discussion on recognition and reconciliation, high level discussion, I, I do want to turn to you and give a few comments on criminal justice reform and restorative justice in the context of rights recognition and reconciliation. So as most of you know, our current criminal justice system disproportionately affects the most vulnerable segments of our population. For example, we know Indigenous peoples interact with our criminal justice system at shockingly high numbers. The statistics are bleak. The rate of violent victimization among Indigenous peoples in Canada is more than double that of non-Indigenous people. Indigenous adults comprise 4.1% of Canada's population, but represent 27% of admissions to federal custody and 30% of provincial and territorial custody. In 2015-16, despite representing 5% of Canada's total female population, Indigenous women made up 38% of federally incarcerated female, the federally incarcerated female population in Canada. In 2016-17, Indigenous youth accounted for 46% of admissions to correctional services while representing 8% of the Canadian youth population. All these figures, 
and the tragic reality they help illustrate are completely unacceptable and of course must change. As a former prosecutor at 222 Main Street in Vancouver, this story is all too familiar to me. A young person, often an Indigenous man, commits a non-violent crime, comes into contact with the criminal justice system, and is really never able to free himself. He gets caught in a vicious cycle of court appearances, court orders, breaches of court orders, and returns to custody. Soon he is spending more time behind bars than he is out of them. This man's interaction with the criminal justice system have further marginalized him, making him even more vulnerable. This story is really a byproduct of our history of imbalance and a sign of how much yet needs to be done. The occurrence of this tragic pattern is inseparable from the historic and contemporary impacts of colonialism and the denial of Indigenous rights that I described earlier. It is in such a con context that disempowerment, hopelessness, the cycles of violence grow. It is also in this context that the criminal justice system has emerged with structures, patterns, and norms that are often alienating unresponsive, and not culturally relevant. That is why the work of supporting recognition and implementation of Indigenous rights, including Indigenous self-determination and the inherent right of self-government, is so critical to establishing a positive foundation where current and future generations of Indigenous youth are born and raised in conditions where their well-being and their ability to thrive will continue to increase where they have hope, are proud to be Indigenous, and consequently their interactions with the criminal justice system should continually decrease. The work to accomplish this includes supporting Indigenous self-governments in the work that they must do and lead in developing their own systems for the administration of justice. The overall success or failure of rebuilding Indigenous nations in Canada and the successful implementation of self-government will in large part be determined by how well Indigenous nations can enforce and adjudicate their own laws, as well as other governments' laws, and how well such systems will fit within the broader legal system in Canada. At the same time, we must also act on other paths to increase or introduce measures and initiatives within the current justice system aimed at reducing the likelihood of an Indigenous person being at disproportionate risk of getting caught in a continuous cycle of interactions. So let us imagine a Canada in which the justice system better aligns with the needs of all Canadians. What if an offender's first interaction with the criminal justice system did not become the first in a series? What if it triggered mechanisms designed to address factors that inspired the criminal behavior in the first place? What if we intentionally and deliberately built off ramps to the system so that individuals' first interaction with the justice system gave them avenues to pursue and to ensure that it was also their last? Clearly, we need innovative solutions, and I know there are solutions, and I know many of you in, in this room have solutions. One of these is to, of course, consider greater use of restorative justice measures and other alternative measures to incarceration where appropriate, such as using provincially established First Nations courts that typically deal with sentencing after a person has pled guilty to criminal code offenses. These measures, as many of you know, seek to make both the victim and the offender active participants in the journey for justice, emphasize repairing relationships, ensure victims have a powerful voice, and the process allows them to heal. While at the same time focuses on the offender taking important accountability for their actions and making sure the differences between cultures and norms are understood again, to find balance. In this sense, I view restorative justice as kind of a circuit breaker from the cycle that many individuals find themselves caught in. In Canada, restorative justice is currently used in every province and territory. 
It is supported by legislation and federal and provincial and territorial government programs and policies. It is used by communities, programs, police, courts, and corrections, as well as by organizations like the Comox Valley Community Justice Center. Over the years, the federal government has shown leadership in this area by enabling restorative justice with legislation and policy, providing training, supporting innovative practices, and conducting research and evaluations. Internationally, the Government of Canada has also been a leader. I was honoured, and I told somebody this earlier today, I was honoured to attend uh, the UN Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice in Vienna earlier this year as head of the Canadian delegation in order to co-sponsor and speak to the most recent resolution in support of restorative justice around the world. That all said, and while restorative justice has been a part of Canada's criminal justice system for over 40 years and has proven effective over that period, it is still not as widely available across the country as it should be, and we need to do more to make sure that this happens. A 2011 Department of Justice uh, Canada report found that Indigenous people who completed a community-based alternative to mainstream justice, such as restorative justice, were significantly less likely to reoffend than those that did not. I am committed to expanding this resource and the resources so that we can move these measures more widely across the country and make them more accepted. Importantly, measures such as specialized courts and restorative justice are aimed at solving the problem that caused the behavior in the first place, as opposed to strictly placing the primary focus on punishment. This provides offenders, again, where appropriate, with a way out of the system. While I strongly believe that offenders must be held account to account for their actions, I also believe that the system must be fair for all that come before it. In addition to the expansive or the expansion of specific restorative justice initiatives, there is a need to also address other factors that contribute to the tragic cycles of incarceration. As many of you will be familiar, earlier this year I introduced Bill C-75, a major piece of legislation to reform the criminal justice system and address delays, a bill which is currently before the Senate. In this bill, or it does a number of it does a number of things. Um, it addresses these issues in a number of ways. It does so by proposing changes to how bail is granted and how breaches of bail conditions will be administered. Accused who do not have access to needed supports and services, such as housing, health care, and social services, are at higher risk of breaching bail conditions, and this can result in further needless incarceration while awaiting trial which further contributes to the overrepresentation of Indigenous and vulnerable people in the criminal justice system. There are also proposed changes for how juries are selected. While Indigenous peoples are overrepresented as victims and offenders, they are underrepresented on juries. We continue to work towards a jury system that better represents our nation's diversity and that enjoys the confidence of all Canadians. We also have changed the way judges are appointed in Canada. We have instituted a more transparent, open process for choosing federally appointed judges with a focus on promoting a modern bench that better reflects the diversity of Canada. We believe that a diverse judicial bench allows those who come before the criminal justice system, either as victims or accused, to see themselves better represented in the system which helps build confidence in our institutions. Consistent with this, I have made it a priority of mine to ensure that Indigenous people, women, and marginalized community are, communities are better represented on the bench. The new process has resulted in more Indigenous peoples being appointed, but I know there's always room for improvement. With respect to the Supreme Court of Canada, our government has also reformed how justices are selected. A potential consideration for candidates now includes their knowledge of Indigenous legal traditions. While there is currently no Indigenous person on the Supreme Court of Canada, I can certainly see uh, this happening, this historic day coming soon. So, in conclusion, and I know I've covered a lot of terrain tonight in this talk, 
we find ourselves in a period of significant change with great opportunity, although one with not, or not without its challenges. While considerable progress has been made, the work of achieving reconciliation involves addressing the imbalance that has plagued our country historically and continues today. The effects of this imbalance are seen in all aspects of society, with the justice system being a core example. Restorative justice represents innovation and action that seeks to tackle the imbalance in one area where it is most visible and most impactful. As Minister of Justice, my message has always been consistent and considered, both internally and externally, that transformative change requires coherent and comprehens a comprehensive approach to the true reconciliation of inherent rights of, of Indigenous peoples. This work is incredibly hard, but must continue. We all need to be advocates for this work, and I'm sure that you will all hold governments to account, elected officials to account, for creating the space to enable the deconstruction of our country's colonial legacy. Finally, we will know when reconciliation is achieved when there is balance, when Indigenous nations are full partners, partners in our Federation, with an approved quality of life, with practicing and thriving cultures. It is our collective task and responsibility to ensure that we see this day. Gaila Kusla, thank you so much for having me in the Comas Valley. So I'd like to call uh, Heather Nay, Vice President of the Community Justice Center, up to the stage, and the two NIC volunteer students who are going to be taking the microphones out into the audience for questions. The minister has agreed to take um, 15 or so minutes of questions and respond to them. Uh, so, oh, Heather's already here. And the two students, well, there's one. All right, I would like to thank the minister for her remarks this evening. They are very insightful and informative and have significantly added to the remarkable legacy of the Campanola Lectures. The minister has grace, graciously, as Bruce has said, um, allowed some time for questions on the subject of her talk this evening. Because of the wide range of issues that are within her responsibility, of the Justice Minister and Attorney General. We'd like to limit the questions to those, questions posed to the Minister, to those within the scope of this evening's presentation. When we do call for a question, please raise your hand and wait for one of our volunteers to get to the, the microphone to you so that we record your question as part of the recording of this event this evening. Your patience is appreciated, and the procedure will ensure that we all enjoy and learn from the conversation. So, do we have somebody who would like to ask the first question? Good to see you. My name is Richard Hardy. I'm with the Comox First Nations uh, aquaculture program, Pentlat Seafoods. Uh, I have a briefing note uh, that I'd like to pass on to you perhaps at the end of your presentation uh, in regards to Comox and the challenges that we're facing with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, your presentation was bang on with regards to reconciliation. Uh, the need for the government, uh, or, or the government at, at least over the last three years has had some progress but from a Comox First Nation perspective that's involved in the treaty process, 
DFO is failing uh, quite badly. <laughs> so anyways, I'll, I'll pass a brief note on to you. I'd also, at this time, would like to thank you again for the work that you do. Uh, I know the sacrifices as a politician uh, for your family, uh, the traveling across Canada, uh, all the work that you do representing the community, uh, the province of British Columbia and Canada, I'd like to say thank you because uh, quite often we don't say that enough to our politicians. So, Aichka, uh, Kela Kessler. My, my son Bobby also said to say hi to you as well. I'll take any briefing notes that people want to give me. <laughs> Hello? Oh, I am on. <laughs> I'm Bill Williams, um, First Nations from Gold River. Um, I was uh, fostered out. I was born with club feet, deaf in both ears, and taken out of my home. And this is one of the reasons why today I became an advocate. Uh, I've been doing it now for 38 years, where I advocate for First Nations people, uh, here locally and provincially, wherever I, people get in contact with me, where they have their child about to be taken away or have been taken away. And what I find uh, with my uh, history is that um, in doing this, that the uh, social workers still lie to the courts about why they take out the, um, the child and everything. And I just helped a young family um, just uh, this past year, um, 2017, uh, where they just gotten their uh, child back after five years of fighting with the courts. And my question is, well, first of all, I'd really like to thank you for being here. And it's an honor to hear from somebody that is of First Nations and that I've been waiting a long time myself, you know, waiting for this day where we have people like yourself uh, doing the job that you do, and I thank you for that. So my question is, will these things, or will it be considered um, in the criminal justice systems um, where uh, children are still being taken away? Well, um, thank you for the for the comments and for the work that, that you do. Um, in terms of the child welfare system, particularly with respect to Indigenous peoples, this is um, a commitment to reform that our government is making. It is a tragedy, the number of Indigenous children that are taken away from their families, and we need to ensure that we do something tangible about it, something meaningful about it. This is uh, under the charge of Minister Jane Philpott, but it is an all a government um, priority, and um, uh, through the leadership of Minister Philpott, we are working very, she is working very closely with Indigenous communities, with leaders, to ensure that we um, provide and create the space for Indigenous uh, communities to draw down jurisdiction around child welfare and to ensure that we do everything we can through legislation eventually, I hope we get there working in partnership, um, to ensure that Indigenous children remain in their homes. Um, I hear you on the issues that you raise, but again, I just want to say that this is a priority that um, our government is working on, particularly under the extraordinary leadership of Minister Philpott, and I know that she would greatly benefit from your your 30 years of experience in working in this area. 38. 38, sorry. 38 years of experience. I've uh, studied criminology. I wasn't even actually supposed to get past grade three, but yet I've been on my own since I was 13 years old. My foster parents kicked me out uh, because after walking straight and hearing for the first time, they, the welfare people, the social workers, uh, the ministry gave the money of the day, which was about $400, $500 in the 60s. And before that, they were getting uh, $1,800 for looking after me. And when I got kicked out, uh, this is the other reason why I became an advocate, because of the situations where, you know, uh, kids are still on their own uh, at the age of 13 and up. You know, you hear stories, teenagers in Vancouver, in the hotels where they commit suicide, 
I tried committing suicide myself because, you know, what 13-year-old kids should be on their own? But thank you very much. Thanks. Hi, um, my name's Constance Jaquest, and I just graduated from the Justice Studies program at Royal Roads University last month. Bravo. Um, so my question is, what do you think it would take for the government to repeal the Indian Act, and what sort of new legislation would you like to see replacing it? Well, thank you, Constance, and congratulations on, on graduating. You're going to be you're going to be a part of of uh, the solution and in, in moving beyond the Indian Act. Um, in terms of repeal of the Indian Act, this has been a conversation for as long as I can remember. And while I was the regional chief, and certainly now that I'm in this position, um, I believe very strongly in terms of putting in place, as I talked about briefly a framework to provide indigenous peoples with the tools necessary to rebuild their nations. That include like, the right to self-determination, including the inherent right of self-government. Um, if we were to repeal the Indian Act, or if the Indian Act was to go away tomorrow, we have to, as indigenous peoples and as governments, and as Canadians, we have to be able to answer the question, what replaces it? So, our obligation as governments, I believe, and certainly the hard work that Indigenous communities have been doing across this country for decades, and there have been amazing successes, is doing the hard work of rebuilding our nations, rebuilding and thinking about our core institutions of government, whether that be how we um, determine who our citizens are, what our structure of government is, how we elect our leaders, what our constitution uh, says um, this is the support that um, governments uh, need to provide to Indigenous peoples, and this is the hard work that Indigenous peoples need to undertake in terms of deconstructing their own colonial legacy. And when um, an Indigenous community or a nation is ready, willing, and able to move beyond the Indian Act, and many have across the country, but when they're ready and able, um, they shouldn't have to go through interminable negotiations or go to a court to say something doesn't apply. But there has to be, and there isn't right now, a mechanism in this country that enables Indigenous communities when they're ready, when they've rebuilt their core institutions of government, to move away from the Indian Act. That's not for the federal government to determine um, and to repeal the Indian Act. Um, it has created a reality that needs to be deconstructed, but deconstructed and led by Indigenous communities themselves. When are we going to get rid of the Indian Act completely? I hope I live to see the day. I, I'm confident and hopeful that is because there are so many Indigenous communities that know by taking over control of their own lives and making decisions for themselves um, is uh, the way to build an economy, it's the way to create hope, and it's the way to transform the country. And I will say for the better in uh, our continuously evolving um, federation. Hello. I have a I have a question of restorative justice. I strongly believe in it. Are you aware that restorative justice has been going on in Vancouver Island for over 30 years? John Howard Society started in the late 1980s. And I think every John Howard in BC has got a restorative justice program going. And I would ask you to do some research into that, and that would make your power presentation more powerful to have success stories from those John Howard Societies. Thank you. I would just say I um, uh, recognize the incredible and extraordinary work that the John Howard Society does, uh, and we uh, benefit from that work greatly. So thank you for saying that. Hi, my name is Ian McIntyre. Uh, I have a question that's going to be a little bit closer to home for you. Um, between the Aboriginal Affairs Department and the Justice Department, uh, they're run on bureaucracies that have established policies and implemented policies for the last hundred years, which are to me, the basis of problems that we're trying to reconcile right now. How have you and how are you turning around your justice de department to rid itself of some of the 
entrenched bureaucracy and the attitude towards First Nations? And how are you redesigning the department to go to the future and handle a little bit more balanced? That's a good question. Look, um, I, I'll say this. I have tremendous respect for the public servants that work within um, the Government of Canada. I have tremendous respect for um, the dedicated public servants that work within Canada's legal team, within the Department of Justice, some of whom are here today. Um, as the minister, I get the benefit of uh, speaking with public servants, with my officials, and talking about um, what my vision is and where we want to go. Um, I spoke a little bit about your question in my remarks. It takes um, great effort. It's incredibly hard to transform or transition to turn a, a big tanker in the water to head in a different direction. We have um, uh, been a country for over 150 years. I am uh, the 51st Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. We have many laws that are still on the books that are discriminatory, and we need to ensure that we do everything we can to change it. So how am I doing that within my own department? Um, Again, working really hard. In terms of our approach to litigation with respect to Indigenous peoples, I've worked very closely with my officials and we jointly developed, um, and I'm hoping at some point I can release a directive around how we engage and how we make decisions with respect to litigation when it comes to Indigenous peoples trying to find other alternatives other than just going to court and pleading every single defense that we can plead, but trying to find alternatives and ways that we can sit down where we can have discussions and try to remedy these um, uh, disputes in a manner that isn't so um, confrontational. Part of that work is to ensure that we try to continuously keep our mind on how it is we're going to change that tanker in a different direction. That includes changing laws, that includes changing policies, but it includes changing the operational practices within our government. And again, it's not easy. Um, uh, again, candidly, it takes effort every day. But what I do know is that there are incredibly hardworking and decent people within the Department of Justice and all ministries across the government that uh, um, want to create the change and are working hard to do that every day. Um, we are not going to resolve, and we're talking about Indigenous issues, we are not going to resolve the challenges that we have with respect to Indigenous peoples and their inability to take their rightful place in this country unless we, uh, in a really concerted and considered way um, move away from the courts because it's not going to be resolved there and sit around um, ensuring we have open discussions and that we create the space for Indigenous peoples to um, take back control of their lives. That's what I've told my departmental officials. They know very well that this is one of my major priorities. And it's not just because I'm an Indigenous person, but I believe fundamentally that the lasting legacy of our government will be what we do with Indigenous peoples, how we build our relationships, and what the framework is that we create for Indigenous peoples to take their rightful place. That's um, how we're going to define ourselves. How we treat the most vulnerable among us defines who we are as a society. And Indigenous peoples uh, deserve, as every other Canadian, the ability to achieve their full potential. And we have to remove the laws and policies and practices that have placed them in the place that they're in 151 years into our country. The next 150 years are going to be uh, incredible as we see Indigenous nations rebuild. Hi, my name is Nerman. I'm here with my team from North Shore Restorative Justice Society. And I would like to um, ask you a question. In your speech, you mentioned that restorative justice has been part of the criminal justice system for over 40 years. You also quoted from a study that says how less likely offenders are to reoffend when they've gone through this. 
process. We work closely with both the RCMP and the municipal police department in our area, and we've been doing a lot of educating with respect to alternative measures being mandatory uh, with the criminal, uh, the C Criminal Justice Act for Youth, Youth Criminal Justice Act, as well as it being something officers have to consider as in their discretion for adults. And as we're educating them, what we're realizing is this is often new information for officers. And this is a huge gap in the system to think that officers are coming out of their training missing this huge part. And I'm just wondering, what are we doing to address that gap? Well, thank you, thank you for that question. And I know what I'm doing immediately is coming to the North Shore to visit all of the ladies that are sitting right there. Um, what are we doing? Um, well, we need to do more. Let me say that up front. Um, we, beyond my championing restorative justice, believe me, we need to invest more dollars into restorative justice. Um, not just when somebody finds themselves in the system, but looking at prevention all throughout the system and as we um, uh, face individuals that are transitioning out of the corrections system. So I've been working very closely with my, with my colleague, um, the Public Safety Minister, Ralph Goodell, to ensure that we're advocating very strongly for the necessary resources that we need putting together um, the necessary plans right across that spectrum that I just spoke about to ensure that the resources are there. Um, uh, and that for his part, in terms of training police officers and law enforcement and other actors about the value of restorative justice, not just having conversations about um, being soft on crime or, or being tough on crime, but having conversations about what it actually means to the individuals that they meet or their life circumstances. So we need to do more in terms of education. Um, we, um, in the Department of Justice, have had many different uh, events. And it's not an event, it's something that has to be ingrained in, into the system, but to raise awareness about the restorative justice measures that exist. I am very hopeful, and if anybody wants to write a letter to the Minister of Finance, that we get investments into restorative justice um, very soon that will enable us to, because I get letters all the time from provinces, from indigenous communities, from organizations that have these amazing programs, um, and we invest in terms of the uh, indigenous justice program, but if we could support the development of more um, restorative justice measures, more specialized courts, it makes a real impact. And long term, and this is what I say to the Minister of Finance, long term, it pays off and it saves us money. And there are so many initiatives that we could support. So um, write letters, and I will come to the North Shore. It's not too far from where I am, and I know there's other people that have meaningful solutions. We need data. We need data to be able to sell our message to. And that is a challenge, but it's an opportunity not only for me as the Federal Minister of Justice, but I need to continue and I'm committed to working with my counterparts in the provinces and territories, as well as with Indigenous governments to make sure that we expand uh, um, all of the really important measures that we have across the country and highlight the work that, you, uh, that you're doing on the North Shore and across uh, in other parts of the country. I'm in your house. All right, um, we'll end it there then. And um, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to invite Bruce, the Chief Administrator of the Community Justice Centre to bring us uh, a closing for the evening and to express our thanks to the Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Heather, for leading our question and answer period, and thank you, Minister, for graciously responding to those questions. <clears throat> As we come to the close of yet another hugely successful Campanola lecture, I really do want to express our deep appreciation to the Minister for her time and gracious acceptance of the invitation to be our seventh annual lecturer.
This evening's lecture has contributed to our understanding of restorative justice and its place in reconciliation, and it will assist in extending the conversations in our community about the practice of restorative justice and what this annual lecture series was intended to stimulate. <clears throat> Over the years, we've been exploring the role and impact of restorative justice as it relates to mental health, community engagement, court-based justice, individual growth and development, and the justice system's impact on young people. This evening's presentation has raised important ideas about the place of, res of restorative justice in the process of reconciliation with First Nations. I'm reminded of last year's lecturer's identification of reconciliation as the most important issue facing our nation today. The minister's comments this evening have provided a good basis for our further reflection on this most important national issue. And if this has sparked a deeper interest in you about what you can do to further the work towards reconciliation, let me say it's not too late to register for the Kitchen Table Dialogues this coming Sunday. Joanne Weens will be at the information table with a couple of our North Island College volunteers to let you sign up for the uh, dialogues this Sunday. It'll start with a tour of the exhibition at the Seabag Gallery, the art gallery in, in, on Duncan Street at 10 o'clock, led by the artists who created those incredible works of art talking about uh, resilience and restorative justice, uh, reconciliation and returning to the claiming of culture and restoring culture in our community. The tour will be followed by a free lunch. I was important to say that it's a free lunch. Uh, at the Native Sons Hall and the dialogues will then explore what we can as individuals do to move toward a just and equitable reconciliation with First Nations. And now, in appreciation for the Minister's time and energy in presenting this year's Campanola on Lecture on Restorative Justice, please join me in expressing again our sincere thanks to the Minister. So this brings to a close the seventh annual Campanola Lecture on Restorative Justice. And to let you in on a little secret for next year, an invitation has been extended to answer the very question that my colleague from the North Shore Restorative Justice Society asked during the question and answer period. We've extended an invitation to the national leader of the RCMP, Commissioner Brenda Lucky, to present the eighth annual lecture next winter or early spring. Look for notices and be assured that you will be warmly welcomed into the restorative justice family. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>